Hello, Washington. Greetings from Cambridge, Cambridge, England, where we've been having much the same sort of event as you have been having in your Earth Optimism Day. We've been hearing about some of the successes that big organisations, governments, charitable bodies have been having in their protecting the world which is so extraordinarily vulnerable and which is so much in need of our help. We all know that there are great problems. We don't hear enough, perhaps, of some of the successes, some of the successes which can give us uh, the courage and the information and the inspiration that we need to continue with this sort of work. But as well as the big organisations, we've also been hearing what individual human beings can do in their daily lives to reduce what we all call the footprint on this world. Nature is the greatest treasure that we have. It deserves all the help it can get. And happily, there are many, many things that we can do, and I believe will succeed in the years to come, doing on a much greater scale than ever before. It's been great talking to you. Good luck with your enterprises, and I know you wish us good luck in ours. Thanks. Well, what a great welcome. And, uh, you know, it's early in the morning, and I'm sure some people were partying last night. So, you know, let's have a rousing. And anybody who can join in this, this is how chimps greet the day. And, you see, that's my signature trademark. I like to begin that way. Uh, well, you know, it, it did really my career as such began when I was watching a hen and wondering where the egg came out when I was four years old. And I apparently waited four hours in the hen house and I actually saw where the egg emerged. So that was my first experience in observing animals. And anyhow, this love of animals led me eventually to save up and go to Africa. Hadn't been to college because we didn't have enough money. So I got to Africa and there I was fortunate enough to meet the late Louis Leakey, and this is now history. He offered me the opportunity to go and study chimpanzees. And gradually, over the years, it became obvious that <laughs> there is no sharp line dividing us from the rest of the animal kingdom. It's a very blurry line. And yet, when I came to Cambridge, because Louis Leakey said, Jane, you have to get a degree, there's no time for a BA. I've got you a place in Cambridge University to do a PhD in ethology, and I didn't even know what ethology was. <laughs> and when I arrived at Cambridge, it was thought at that time, 1962, that the difference between us and other animals was one of kind. And I, you know, I was talking about the personalities of the chimpanzees I'd come to know. I was talking about uh, the fact that they had emotions like happiness, sadness, fear, that they had a good intellect and could solve problems, and that they had personalities. And I was told by many of the professors here that uh, this was wrong, my science was wrong, animals should be numbered, and these other attributes were unique to us. Well, fortunately, I'd learned as a child from my dog that that wasn't true, and I had an amazing supervisor, and it feels very strange to come to Cambridge with no Robert Hind here. But he managed to steer this ignorant, naive young woman through the hurdles so that I got my PhD, whilst managing to hang on to my conviction that the scientists who told me uh, that animals were so different were wrong. And back in Gombe, I built up a research station. It was the most amazing time in my life because I had time to be out in the rainforest. I could feel the interconnectedness between all the different species in the rainforest and how each one had its role to play and each one mattered. And time with the chimps, I built up a research station, fantastic students came, I could talk to them in the evenings. And 
why did I leave? I left because in 1986, at a conference in the US, we brought together all the people who at that time were studying chimps in about, I think it was six or seven different parts of Africa. And it was a shock. I think it was a shock to all of us to find that everywhere where people were out in the field, chimpanzee numbers were dropping, forests were disappearing. Uh, there was the beginning of the bushmeat trade, the commercial hunting of wild animals for food, the live animal trafficking mothers shot to sell their infants. And there was the logging companies coming in and human populations growing. And it was grim. And I went to that conference. By then, I was a scientist with a wonderful life. And without making any conscious decision, I left as an activist. I knew I had to try to do something. I had no idea what I could do. I went to Africa. And I managed to get enough money to go to six range countries. And yes, I did learn more about the chimpanzees. But I also began to learn about the plight of so many of the people living in and around the forest areas. And this came to a head when I flew over the little Gombe National Park. It's only about 30 square miles. Originally, it was part of the equatorial forest belt. And when I flew over in 1991, I was shocked to look down and see a little oasis of forest surrounded by completely bare hills. And if I had photographs, I'd show you, but you can look them up on the internet. They were bare. There were more people living there than the land could support, struggling to survive, cutting down the forest because they had to, to try and feed their families. And so it was at that time that I realized, unless we help the people to have better lives, there's no chance of saving the chimpanzees. And we began a project called Take Care or Takari, that's the Jane Goodall Institute, and starting with what the people in the villages thought we might do to help them, that's where we began. We got small grants, and the program became successful. I have no time to go into the details again, you can look it up on the internet. But it was so successful that the villagers have now become our partners. And they are setting aside land for restoration. The trees in that part of the world anyway are, are very resilient from seeds left in the ground. The trees have now sprung up. There are no more bare hills around Gombe. We began with 12 villagers. We're now in 52 around Gombe. We're restoring the forest down in the south. We're protecting the forest and its chimpanzees. And this is so successful that this program is now starting in six other African countries. So all of this, of course, uh, <laughs> takes a lot of money. And so I began traveling around because people wanted me to come and talk. And I thought, well, I can raise awareness, too, about what's going on in Africa and the problems we face there. At the same time, I was trying to, to raise some funds. And of course, then I began learning more and more about what I already knew something about, and that is what we are doing to this planet, what we're doing to Mother Earth. And here you come to the big difference between us and chimpanzees, the explosive development of our intellect. So how bizarre that the most intellectual creature to ever walk on planet Earth is destroying its only home. And I don't need to explain to you who are here today what, what it is that we're doing but we are recklessly using the finite natural resources. And soon we shall get to a point of no return. Soon the doomsday scientists will be proved right. But as Ben says, we have a window of time. And in that window of time, it's up to each and every one of us to try and make change. And some people are in a much more um, better position to make that change than others but we can all do our part. And thing, the lucky thing for me is, you know, I'm traveling 300 days a year all around the world, and it's pretty exhausting, and it's pretty grim. Make no mistake, I see areas that have been devastated, and when you see piles of elephant tusks in some, uh, you know, government confiscation area, and when you see uh, forests raised to the ground, it's grim, but at the same time, Everywhere I go, I'm meeting amazing people who are fighting to save a species. 
whether it's animal or plant, who are fighting to restore an environment, who are fighting to clean a river. And you'll hear about some of those things today. So there are these amazing projects and these incredible people everywhere I go. There is much more awareness now than there was 10 years ago. And it's a bit sad that not enough people are changing their behavior. And that's partly because people feel, what can I do? I'm one person, there's so many problems in the world. And they feel helpless and hopeless. And I realized as I was traveling around that so many young people, high school students, university students, uh, young people out in their first job, they felt the same. And I talked to them and they said, well, we feel this way because you've compromised our future and there's nothing we can do about it. We have compromised the future of young people. You hear this saying, we haven't inherited this planet from our parents, we borrowed it from our children. We haven't borrowed from our children, we've stolen it. And we're still stealing their future. And we now have to get together around the world and help our young people to restore some of the harm that we've inflicted. So it was because of this that I began our Roots and Shoots program back in 1991 <coughs> in Tanzania with 12 high school students who came to me concerned about all kinds of different problems in, in Dar es Salaam. They were worried about the street children sniffing glue who had no homes. They were worried about the cruel treatment of domestic dogs, stray dogs. They were worried about the destruction of the coral reefs. They were worried about why isn't the government prosecuting the poachers who are killing elephants and giraffes in our national parks. And so I told them to get together friends who felt the same. And we had a meeting and from that meeting, this program Roots and Shoots was born. And right from the beginning, the main message was the message that Ben delivered so eloquently earlier, every single one of us can make a difference every single day. And it may seem that the choices we make, what we buy, what we eat, what we wear, make no difference in the sum of things. And if it was just one person making ethical choices, it wouldn't make any difference. But the cumulative effect of hundreds, then thousands, then millions, and eventually billions of people all making ethical choices will start to move us towards the kind of world that we can pass down to our children with a little bit of pride. Right now, we can't. So from the start, because I have always understood the interconnectedness of all, all living things and all problems too, it was decided that the Roots and Shoots groups would tackle three different projects, which they would choose themselves. It was not going to be a top-down, this is what you do. No, this is going to be a group of young people. What are you passionate about? Okay, some of them are passionate about animals. Some of them are passionate about the environment and the pollution and the litter. Some of them are passionate about the fate of the people around them. And so, from the start, every group chooses three projects. Animals, people, environment. It doesn't mean every member of the group has to do all of it, but they do have to share the results of their projects. And I can tell you the difference this is making. From those 12 high school students, when we began in 1991, Roots and Shoots is now in 98 countries and growing. And we have members from kindergarten, even a few preschoolers, very strong in university, everything in between, and it's even beginning to slowly move outwards into older people so that we have some very successful uh, programs for old people, uh, retired people. We have programs that are working really well in prisons and among the staff of some big corporations, but basically it's youth and youth driven. And it, it's everywhere I go now, there are young people with shining eyes wanting to tell Dr. Jane what they've been doing to make this a better world. They are inspired and they understand the problems. And because we listen to their voices, they are empowered. And so I say Roots and Shoots is making a difference. Let me give you one example. 
I've been going back and forth to China since 1993. And when I first went, nobody was talking about the environment. In fact, they weren't allowed to by the government. And there was not much concern for animals, a lot of cruelty around. But gradually, as Roots and Shoots has spread, there's about 2,000 groups in China now. And I've seen over the years how attitudes have changed. And so just on this last trip before Christmas, there were so many people saying, well, of course I care about the environment. I was in Roots and Shoots in primary school. Of course I care about animals. I was watching your National Geographic documentaries about you and the chimps when I was in primary school. So Roots and Shoots has had some impact on changing attitudes in a country like China. You all know they've banned the sale of ivory by the end of this year. They've closed down the factories where the ivory ornaments were carved. Um, they're building a huge, what they call a bird airport. It's merely a huge area on the main migration route of birds through China where they've got wetlands and, and it's going to have a big education center. So it, it really has made a difference. But I think, you know, one of the most important things is to realize what we are doing that's so important. And we're doing it because of what I call the indomitable human spirit, the people who tackle the impossible and won't give up. And it's led to change in so many different areas. It's led, as I've said, to people fighting on the ground to save species and to restore habitats. It's led to the development of some innovative technology where we actually, if governments would subsidize clean, sustainable energy instead of still clinging to the, their old buddies in the fossil fuel uh, industry, we could be free of fossil fuels and all the resulting pollution. Uh, but, you know, we have a long way to go, and another responsibility of ours is if we really care, then we mustn't buy products from companies and, and industries that are polluting. We need to write to our governments. We need to make our voices heard. And through social media now, we can do this in a way that was never possible before. We can gather hundreds of thousands of people around the world to, to coordinate and express what they're feeling about a single issue. So today is Earth Day. It's a day when around the world people are marching for science. And of course, science has been receiving a battering in the United States. And so our Roots and Shoots groups, indeed, all around the world are taking part in these marches for science. And eventually, if enough of us get together and make our voices heard, it will lead to governments and business changing. But we must play our parts. So I think I want to end up, there's an awful lot more to say, but I hope that some of you visit the Solutions Fair. We have a Roots and Shoots booth there. Um, I am sure that during today you're going to be inspired because uh, I know that some of the people giving talks are very inspirational and their projects are, are very inspirational. I wish I had a lot more time. I'd love to talk about some of these projects. And it was these inspirational people and amazing programs that I encountered that led me to write the last two books. One is Hope for Animals and Their World, where every chapter is about a, a species that wouldn't be with us if it wasn't for these people who said, no, not on our watch. And the second one, Seeds, Seeds of Hope, which is about the plant kingdom. And what an amazing journey for me that was. And how incredible are these plants and trees. And the fact that trees can communicate with each other by pheromones and by uh, microfungi in the roots. I mean, we've got so much to learn. And I always say when I'm in a university, if anybody wants to study animal behavior or plants today, it is the most exciting time in my whole 83 years because you can now study things about animals which I couldn't have studied because I was told they didn't exist. Animals didn't have emotions. They didn't have uh, ability to reason and they didn't have personalities. Now you can study those things. And we're finding out so much. It's a very exciting time. And I want to end with a, I think the video is three minutes, just to show 
it's not only humans who have this indomitable spirit. It's other species too. And this is a little video about one of the chimpanzee orphans uh, that we've taken into our two big sanctuaries in Africa, whose mothers were mostly killed for the bushmeat trade. And it's about a chimpanzee who twice came close to death, once when her mother was shot, another time when she had a terrible disease and was saved by the first blood-to-blood, -blood chimpanzee blood-to-blood -blood transfusion in Africa by our wonderful veterinarian, uh, Rebecca. So I want to end with this little four-minute video, which kind of takes me back to my roots. Some of you will have seen it, but you won't mind seeing it again. This is a really exciting moment for me. The Jane Goodall Institute Chimpunga Chimpanzee Rehabilitation Center in the Republic of Congo has for years been caring for infants whose mothers were killed, mostly for the illegal bushmeat trade. Many of them are now fully grown. Recently, we acquired three large forested islands on the beautiful Quilu River, where we can release many of the chimpanzees from our overcrowded center. In here is Wunda, and she nearly died, but thanks to Rebecca, she came back from the dead. And here she is, about to come out into this paradise. She's the 15th chimpanzee to get her freedom here. And we hope, ultimately, to have about 60 on the island. Today is the first time I've met Wunda. I talked to her on the boat, trying to reassure her. She must have wondered what was happening. None of us could predict exactly what she would do once the cage door opened. It was a very, very touching moment. One of the most amazing things that's ever happened to me. The warmth of her embrace is something I shall never forget. For Wunda and all the other chimpanzees we're working to bring here, Chinzula Island will provide a wonderful forest home where they will be cared for and safe. Let me just tell you, Wunda uh, is an amazing female in many ways. All of our females are on birth control because, you know, we've already got 67 chimpanzees and it's very expensive. One of the females, just one, the implant went wrong and that was Wunda. Wunda is now the alpha female of a group of 30, including adult males, although that will change. She had her baby successfully and we've called that baby hope. So there is hope for the future. And I can't stop without thanking all the staff and volunteers of the Jane Goodall Institute, uh, you know, including Ben and others who are here today. If there was time, I'd tell you all their names, but I'd be in big trouble from Ben. And uh, he's not my waiter anymore. So uh, you know. anyway, so thank you all for listening. And, you know, don't forget, Every single day, every single one of us makes some kind of difference, and we have a choice. What kind of difference are we going to make? Thank you. About the planet's future. <laughs> yeah. Right, okay. If you'd all been really cheery, we could have just gone home now. So I'm glad you're still needing a little bit more inspiration and optimism. 
For those of you who weren't here this morning, uh, we've been saving frogs in Africa, we've been uh, saving albatrosses in the southern oceans, we've been saving primates, and indeed we've been saving beauty in England. And we've also been trying to work out how can we have prosperity without growth. Um, this afternoon's all about how we work with communities together to make the world a better place. Uh, and we'll be going to Essex, Brighton, across the whole of the United Kingdom, and we'll end up in Madagascar. Um, but before we start, um, we've got an absolute treat for you. Uh, and provided the uh, video is playing, we've got, an we've got a message from an incredibly extraordinary place. So, play the video, please. Greetings from the International Space Station. I'm Expedition 51 Commander Peggy Whitson of NASA. We're delighted to join you for the inaugural Earth Optimism Summit as we celebrate and share success stories in conservation from around the world. Our unique vantage point from space allows us to see and appreciate our home planet in amazing ways. NASA observes the Earth using a variety of instruments, including some that are based right here on Space Station, for the benefit of all humanity. We wish all of you a very productive summit and thank you for the inspirational work you do in protecting our home. Uh, we're now going to stay in the southeast of England, and we're going to go to Brighton, uh, and we are going to have a talk by Dan Donohar, who is a biodiversity educationist from a school down in Brighton, uh, and he's been doing this for a long period of time, and you'll be able to hear about how he is helping people to become a naturalist, and indeed offering us all a lesson in biodiversity education. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. Uh, when Andrew asked me to give the talk, he said, Dan, we need some good news, so I'm trying to give it to you in bucket loads. Here we go with a bash. This is Dorothy Stringer School, in some ways a bog-standard school, but in fact it's quite an amazing school because we've got lots of staff who've really helped push the uh, biodiversity education agenda. Um, I started there 18 years ago uh, in 1999, and when I got there, um, uh, this was a, one of the first things which we did in the spring of that, that academic year, taking some children on an uh, ecology trip to Oxford, and, and it made me realise that this just wasn't enough. We needed to do a lot more. So one of the first things that we did was take a derelict building in our school and we turned that into an environmental centre. We did it up uh, and uh, we had a formal opening. And what was really great about that was the opportunity for us to have a heart for em environmental education within the school. That then led to other things like uh, working on our woodland. It's a 28 hectare site, the Surrenden campus site. There's six educational institutions on it, and we're the lucky one that's got a bit of woodland. So we were working like mad with parents, child, uh, sorry, parents, children, uh, governors, uh, all kinds of people, neighbours, to, to work on our woodland. Um, uh, and that started building stuff in the community. So this is like one of the parents, and he really got into uh, the whole project and made a load of bird boxes. So we were sticking the bird boxes up. And this work in the community slowly started to build. Of course, now every child needs by a right, I guess, to be dipping into a pond. So we knew we had to do a pond. And we went to Barclays, and they gave us £10,000 to do this. And uh, if you ever want to cement a community together, together, then what you do is you move six tonnes of concrete in two hours, <laughs> and that has the effect. So there we all were, working like mad, and that led to this. Oh, sorry, beg your pardon. That led to this, which is a lovely biodiversity-rich pond. Now, thousands of children have had access to that over the years. And the funding that we had also gave us enough money to start doing more outreach with other schools, and they started coming to us to do some work uh, in, in different ways. Of course, field trips are really important, and we're lucky because we're in Sussex, and it's a fantastic part of the world. Here we're on the South Downs overlooking the world, and we've done our absolute best to get children out into the, into the countryside as much as we possibly can. Um, because it's a fantastic playground, filled with all kinds of habitats, filled with all kinds of things to be seen. Uh, and in fact, I call these the crown jewels, the Adonis blue butterfly, the largest colony of burnt tip orchids, the, some of the largest colonies of the early spider orchids. We know that the kids are really, really privileged to see this, and they're like a mile or two from our school. Not every kid has that access, but we're making the most of it. Uh, but of course, you can't always pick 
an early spider orchid, can you? So we want them to have hands on. So every year it's a, it's a popular thing for us to have what we call taking the kids to the bug fair, the Amateur Entomologist Society. And they buy and they hold and they look after all kinds of bugs as a consequence. Uh, well, uh, doing the field trips gave us a bit of a confidence and we applied for this uh, award. We won it twice, in fact. Had to go to Parliament to go and uh, get our award. And it was great at the time. There's uh, uh, Elliot Morley, who was the then Environment Minister. And it was a great opportunity for kids to be involved in that whole process and to get experience in that way. Uh, and as a consequence, uh, we, we, we developed uh, really good relationships with schools in uh, northern France. Uh, and we learned not just about the wildlife, but about their cultural perspectives. And in fact, since then, we've built up a 10-year program of, of biodiversity-related work in Ghana, West Africa. Uh, and, and it's had a similarly uh, powerful impacts on the pupils of our school. Now, we had a, a managed woodland, a 400-year-old managed woodland. We had a, a fantastic pond. But, you know, you can't take every single child to the countryside. So we could try to bring the countryside to them. So... This is a paper I read in 1994, which described how you, uh, anthills are uh, topographically modified, sorry, to, uh, topographical shapes which manipulate microclimate. And so some guys said, oops, I beg your pardon. And so some scientists, some guys, <laughs> some scientists said that actually maybe what we could do is modify chalk, chalk downland in that way to be able to uh, make nice environments for uh, butterflies and, and so, such like. Now, that was 1994. It wasn't until then when the, a £10,000 grant was available from the breeding places. And I, I knew that lots of schools would be going for planting woodlands. I knew they'd be going for planting ponds. I'm sorry, making ponds. But I, uh, but I didn't think many of them would be going for topographical modification of, of chalk grass and fairly <laughs> successional <laughs> chalk grass and butterflies. So um, we got it, of course. Uh, and the first thing we did was a survey. We took 10, 10 species uh, in our municipal amenity grass, and that's what we had. Uh, Oh, sorry, it does jump. Uh, that's, a, that's the work beforehand, and this is our modified banks shortly afterwards. Um, then we work with John Gapper, who's been growing his own seed bank for the last 35 years, and we've put on this site now over 30,000 30, wildflower plugs into it. We've uh, had, uh, and here's the kids doing it, 1,700 children have had access to that on more than one occasion. Um, uh, we've also planted up with, with uh, Emma's Gate wildflower seed mix. We've worked with the uh, UK Native Seed Hub at Kew, having bespoke seed mixes ordered there. Um, and this is a result. Here's a before and here's the after. I mean, to me, it seems to me that there's a real difference here. Um, but don't take my word for it. This is the late Liz Williams, who we la latterly uh, named the, uh, the butterfly haven, as we call it, afterwards. And this is Peter Hodge. Liz came up in the first year with... 97 wildflower species, so that's an order of magnitude uh, greater biodiversity than there was before. N n let me just point out something here. We're not talking about just raising awareness here. We're literally talking about raising biodiversity. That's the difference. Anyway, how about the bugs? Lots and lots of bugs here, including uh, like red data book species, uh, nationally scarce species, even stuff, this one here, this uh, picture wing fly, I was reliably informed by Peter, it was the first time it's ever been recorded in the UK. That's because we're right down the south coast. Um, this is the face that you make <laughs> when suddenly you're told you've got a nationally rare butterfly that's in, come onto your butterfly haven. And uh, the small blue, in fact, has, has been there ever since we've managed to sight it. Um, uh, this is it by 2010 when David Bellamy came to visit. Uh, it's certainly getting more and more picturesque. Uh, and going back to butterflies, we've now recorded since 2008, 2000, sorry, 20, I wish it was 2000, 27 <laughs> species and 76% of the Brighton Hove fauna. Um, and so that's really worked really well. Um, now, what we've done is we've talked to the Parks Department, we've talked to the planners, uh, and we managed to convince the Parks Department that they should be doing this, and there's now 25 butterfly havens all over Brighton and Hove. Uh, we were able to uh, put them up for a, an award. They, they got the Marsh Christian Award for Major Contributions to Lepidoptera uh, Conservation. And, uh, uh, and of course, you can see I've got my comedy moustache there. And um, <laughs> so, 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 yeah, obviously making an impact in that, mate, putting lots of, lots of fragmented habitat all over our, our city. In 2010, we took the idea of biodiversity and come up with this term, big nature, as a synonym for biodiversity, so it's uh, easily accessible. And uh, during that international year, we uh, led uh, a coalition of partners in the city to be able to look at how we might be able to put on events every single month uh, uh, so that uh, the, the our citizens were aware of what was going on internationally. Um, 
Uh, we did, of course, uh, put out 20,000 Be Aware uh, uh, leaflets in the Citizen Science Project. And we did a lot of our work with people in France and we could compare because both countries were doing stuff on the, the same website. We could see what's going on there. Um, we did what we called the Big Biodiversity Butterfly Count. And uh, uh, Martin Warren, uh, former CEO of Butterfly Conservation, came along to that and he said, you know, actually, this is a damn good idea. So as a consequence, it inspired Butterfly Conservation, the national charity, then to take out to what you might know now as the Big Biodiversity, sorry, the Big Butterfly Count. I always get it wrong. So, so that was rather ex exciting in that, that, that some of the ideas were being picked up. At the end of that year, we had a conference to which uh, uh, we had a, a whole load of people thinking initially about global issues, about national issues, and finally local issues. And, and we did one of the few really wise things. We got our CEO for the city council to come along to chair, and he brought some councillors along. And as a consequence to that, they agreed to fund a post for somebody to write up a bid for a biosphere designation for our region. So after four years of working, we have now got UNESCO biosphere status uh, down at Brighton and Hove. Now, this is an area about the size of, uh, of Isle of Wight. Um, so to, to follow on and try and encourage more people to get involved with the biosphere, we've now set up things like Facebook pages for butterflies of the biosphere. We do videos about butterflies of the biosphere that, so that people can actually find out about what's in there and become familiar with this new landscape designation, this new place. We've got posters of butterflies of the biosphere. Just had 24,000 of those done. So the idea is if, if you live in a biosphere and you see a butterfly, it's on that poster. And that can be in your, your normally they're in people's toilets. <laughs> anyway, uh, Big Nature, where's that gone? It's now become a, a charitable company. And, uh, and the idea is that what we're trying to do is push forward and get people to be thinking much more about uh, habitat restoration in, in the back gardens. Uh, so if you have a wildflower meadow in your back garden or if you ha dig a pond, the idea is the very next morning you want to go out and see it. So you're connecting. You have that emotional and intellectual relationship. Um, what are we doing at Dorothy Stringer these days? Well, the government, in its infinite wisdom, decided that they would get rid of the GCSE environmental science, they would get rid of A-level environmental science, and they would get rid of bu uh, rural, B sorry, BTEC rural science. Uh, so what have we done in response? We've now, instead of uh, one class of GCSE environmental science, we've now got 320 children in year seven doing environmental science every year. Uh, as a consequence, we also now do a new class which is called How to Become a Naturalist, and we've also got a class which is called Forest Kitchen, uh, which gets uh, children uh, getting involved in, in, and actually cooking all kinds of stuff within the forest, a bit like the forest schools, but it gives them, a f gives them food at the same time. Um, so why have we done all this? Well, let's just think about this. Try not doing this. Okay, it's impossible, isn't it? Because if you've learnt, if you've learnt, or if you've been taught how to teach, uh, uh, how to read English, then it's almost impossible not to know that. But if it's like that, that becomes a little bit more difficult. And we think that it's a bit like that. Kids are out of contact with the natural world. They're not, they're not, they're not really relating to it. So we want them to learn the language of how to read the countryside. And kids like this are getting that opportunity all the time. We believe that. By just by kn knowing what species are, we're, we're raising their bioliteracy. We, we believe that by counting uh, populations, like in bird, in bird counts every year, they're beginning to see their populations rise and fall and, and realise that it's just as important as how uh, stocks uh, and shares are going up and down. Uh, and by doing that, we believe that they are, I've made this word up, that they are <laughs> getting an emotional connection with the natural world and, and, and it has meaning to them. Because, as one very clever chap said, no one will protect what they do, uh, oh, sorry, no one will protect what they don't care about, and no one will care about what they have never experienced. That's at the heart of it. Now, if any of this resonates with you, I beg you, go home tonight, get on the internet, and go search out this petition to develop a GCSE in natural history. It closes on the 3rd of May, and we've got to get to 10,000 signatures. If anyone out on the wo World Wide Web, if you can see that as well, then please <laughs> sign as well. Uh, because if we do, we might give him a chance to become a naturalist. Thank you very much. Uh, Dan, I thought that was absolutely inspirational. I wish every single school across the land had a Dan Donahoe. That was absolutely amazing.
Today is Earth Optimism Day. Quite right, too. We've heard marvelous stories of heartwarming successes. Splendid. And if I may say so, Tony Martin, that pictures of South Georgia and what you did with those rats. That warmed my heart. <laughs> okay, let me indulge myself and just add one further glorious piece <clears throat> of optimism as far as I'm concerned. Happened only two days ago. Six years ago, I was, went to Borneo for the first time. And I traveled down a river called the Kinabatang in northeast Borneo in Sabah. And it was a revelation. I'd never been to the Southeast Asia before. And I saw fantastic animals. Orangutan, proboscis monkeys. The, one of the great thrills of that trip were pygmy Borneo elephants, which I didn't see, but we went into a very thick forest and we found um, a, a rock buried in the vegetation. And I sat on the rock and in this thick forest I could hear forest elephants. And they came right down below me and I could hear the snuffling noises. I could even, perhaps this is my imagination, but I, I truly think I could hear them, the indigestion of their <laughs> growing stomach. Memorable. Fantastic. And I went back to Borneo a year ago, 18 months ago, and I went back to the Kinabatangan River. And I went down the river, and there was the rainforest on the side of the bank. But it wasn't quite what I remembered. There are often eight species of hornbills, for example, uh, in Borneo. And although I can't swear that I saw all eight of them 60 years ago, I did see several. But this rainforest was a bit impoverished. And the day after that, we got in a helicopter and we flew along the Kinabatangan River. And as we rose up in the helicopter, I saw that along the banks, this rainforest was perhaps 50 yards wide, 100 yards wide. Beyond it, a monoculture of palm oil, palm oil palm, oil palm just stretching as far as the eye could see in serried, military, sterile ranks. And nothing else in that forest. And that was pretty gloom-making. And what was even more gloom-making was to hear a few months ago that part of that forest which did remain down in the lower reaches of the Kinabatangan was going to be bisected by a huge bridge which would go across the river and bring traffic into that part of Borneo. And I knew in my heart that if that happened, that last patch of Borneo, which still had not yet gone, succumbed to palm oil, it was going to be the end of it. Two days ago, in London, the chief conservator of forests in Sabah said to an assembled company that he, leading his government, had decided to abandon the Kinabatakan River Bridge. It was marvelous news that a government of, of, of Malays in Borneo had decided to take note of what conservationists were saying around the world and do something about it. That's my good piece of news. And you, as I have today, but not yesterday, you have been hearing other marvelous examples of what is happening. But at the back of my mind, and maybe at the back of your minds, 
There's a voice which says yes, but what about climate change? What about rising population? What about the fact that, say, 60 years ago when you were in the Kinabatangan River, there were, compared with that day and today, there are three times as many human beings on this planet. What about that? What about the rising sea temperatures that are causing coral reefs to bleach all along the east coast of Australia? What about that? What's the difference? Well, the difference is that what we've been hearing about today and yesterday are the marvelous examples of what individuals, small associations of enthusiasts, in some instances big companies, but essentially small groups of people have been doing and they're wonderful successes. But the worries that worry me now are the worries that can only be dealt with by international cooperation. No longer just a big company or an enlightened company. No longer just, indeed, a one particular administration in the government. This can only be dealt with by people getting together worldwide and agreeing to do something. Now, that's a very rare thing to happen. When has it happened that people worldwide have got together and agreed on anything? <laughs> it hasn't, except once. 60 years ago, about, the nation's conservationists like you got together and persuaded people that whales were being exterminated, that people worldwide were sweeping the oceans and with new techniques of devastation and murder were eliminating marine, great marine mammals. And that something had to be done. If we went on plundering those whales, they were going to be exterminated. But no nation could do it by itself. And all the maritime nations did get together. They did agree to do something. And the result was that today, whales are now back in the oceans of the world. So it can be done. It, the problems that the, the nations of the world now face, not just in the Indonesian Borneo or South Georgia or wherever, but worldwide, they can only be done by international agreement. That's very hard to achieve. But the United Nations has been doing stuff about it. There have been successes. It looked, a year last Christmas, it looked as though we were getting somewhere that the nations of the world were beginning to see sense. They were getting together. They were going to agree on a way in which we could curb the outputs that are causing the accumulation of greenhouse gases and causing the world temperature to rise. I saw the chief scientist who was coming to the end of his uh, uh, career and who had led a British delegation in these arguments. And I saw the joy on his face uh, when he uh, said to me, it's through. We are going to get agreements. We have got agreements. It now just has to be um, put into effect. Well, there's black news coming from the states because those in power in the states at the moment uh, say uh, that this agreement will be torn up. Will that happen? 
I don't know. The president has changed his mind on certain things. Maybe he'll change his mind again. If he doesn't, we keep at it. If he doesn't, the conservationists whose work you have been seeing today and hundreds, thousands more like them will stick to the problem, will stick to the solution, will keep at it, will make us certain that the greatest treasure that the world has is its natural world in all its diversity, in all its glory. We will keep at it and we will tell our politicians that we require it. Am I optimistic? I'm optimistic because of children. I see a lot of children. Children write to me. I hear a lot from children. And it's my impression that over the last 60 or 70 years, the children of this world have become aware of what is happening and have become unquestionably supportive of the, of the knowledge and the faith that the natural world is their inheritance and it's there for hand on to their children. I hope that is true because those children are the people who have been doing the sort of work when their time comes that you have all been doing, that you have all been doing on this Earth Optimism Day. I pray that that may be so and that the young people that are coming up from this next generation and the generation after that will come around our international agreement and understand that it's no longer the problem of a small group of people, of dedicated enthusiasts, of skilled people. It is to the interests of humanity that we come together and we sink our individual differences and we make this the planet not only for ourselves but for everything alive today. Thank you.